everyone. Okay, so after an on-screen battle between Okiji and Blackbeard, we get a pretty big lore dump that the final road poneglyph lies in the hands of, a, of someone with a burn scar. A, a man with a burn scar. And I've consumed so many theory videos about who this man could be, from Dragon to Shanks or someone related to him, to even even even, even one of Roger's old crew who could possibly still be alive. I, I think it was, it was Scott Bergabin, who who is also on the list. Uh, and as far as my personal opinion on who this mystery person could be, I have tended to lean more towards Dragon nowadays, especially when going back to his first introduction and his speech he meant and his first very big speech he mentions how convinced he is that Lu that he and Luffy will one day meet. Like that in itself, like practically seems to give give away the ghost that he does in fact have the final rogue poneglyph in his possession, and, like, <clears throat> even more than that, it does make sense from, 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 a, from a narrative level that, that, like, that one of the reasons as to possibly why Dragon even, even is doing all the things he's doing, why he's, why he's formed the Revolution Army is because he himself, he does, is made, he himself does know like to some degree of, of what of what the history of the world truly is. So yeah, in in all those ways, it does kind of make sense. Um, now, the only the only question the only question is if the, if this is if this is all the case, then where has he hidden it? Because it would need to be somewhere not even the government can find. And that is, I I guess that is where I tend to maybe lean a little more in, into the into the Shanks column too, is because the. the is because Elbaf would kind of be the perfect place to hide the Royal Poneglyph, and with Shanks having kind of put up put up Rooster or, or having Elbaf as one of its protectorates, it would be kind of one of the perfect places to hide the Royal Poneglyph. It's just a it's just a burn scar aspect that's a little questionable with Shanks's with Shanks being the man with the burn scar, which does bring which does still bring me back to Dragon and the idea that again he is the man with the burn scars, but. The funny thing is, the funny thing is, even though I am convinced it's Dragon, I'm I got like I'm ninety percent convinced it's him. There's that very strong ten percent that's tell that is ultimately telling me all, all these all this theory crafting we're, we're doing around the bur around the burn scar man is entirely pointless. Like for me, I'm. Like a lot of a, everything I've seen about every video I've seen about the Burn Scar Man, it always has me coming back to this weird feeling like Oda is purposefully leading us on a wild goose chase. Like he's 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 wanting us us as readers to come up us as readers and viewers in order to come up with as many cocaine fueled crack theories as humanly possible, only to reveal that none of them were right and that the Burn Scar Man is someone entirely different, a character that Oda has yet to formally introduce in the story. A again, I'm I'm still I'm still pretty confident it's Dragon, but it's like ultimately like I th I think uh, Oda being the way he is kind of makes me say that yeah he's he's leading us on a on a bit of a goose chase and telling us and, j and well and Oda's just sitting back going hey, go ahead look, I want you to come up with as many fucking theories as you fucking as you guys can. I bet you won't even even get it right in the end. Like that that is kind of like that's just kind of an mo with Oda is that he he loves to kind of he loves to subvert the expectations we have first. Like he always takes our expectations and completely like flip like flips them on our, on our head in a way that's like what the fuck. So yeah. I'm, th that's kind of where I'm at. I, I do believe it's Dragon, but I'm, I'm not, at the same time, it's like, the, the, Oda is kind of a master at kind of taking what our, what our expectations are and just completely flipping them on his head. Um, with all that said, though, <clears throat> yeah, let's get to the real highlight of the episode, which is Kuzan versus Garp. And admittedly, the episode didn't cover as much of the fight as I would have liked, but the seeds have been planted just with their back and forth and them trading verbal bars with each other. Like, you, you do see there's some deep, deep-rooted history and respect there, especially with especially with Kuzon asking wh whether Garp has what it takes to kill his pupil from the past to save his, to save his current pupil, Kobe. And 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 ha then, then Garp responding, didn't I say to stop living, didn't I say to live in the... In, in the now, not in the past, idiot. And, like, more than anything else, I feel this 
episode is really, really kind of exposed to us, the viewer, just how deep Rudy Kuzan's resentment, I think, is towards everything, whether it's whether it has to do with his his past, his present, his his past, his present, and just how how he views the world right now, like and and just as well as the current military struck military regime in the navy, like and how like I I think he's felt, I think more than I think more than anything, I think what's revealed through this episode is how even though he respects Garp, he he also kind of feels the the Marines and what they stood for. Have lost the soul of what they what they need to represent, but failed. But he, but simultaneously, he recognized he himself failed to change it after, after losing to, to basically a kainu. So yet, and yet simultaneously, yet again, he still admires Garp for, for for never for never wavering like he did as well. It's again, it's one of those things that really makes a that really makes some. Um, it really makes Kuzan a very confusingly complex character. Like his emotions, I think, are, are just all over the fucking place. And yeah, obviously, in the background of all that, the art and animation during the whole fight sequence was on point. Like barely losing a step from last week, they made that whole fight look clean. And you know, the even funnier part about this fight, at least to me, is that Garp is that for Garp fighting Kuzan was just another training session. Like. Almost like Garp was still treating Kuzan like his student during the whole fight, saying, I'm going to drill everything I taught you back into that thick skull of yours. And this fight in general is just another example of how, for however powerful the Admirals both pre- and post-timescape are, Garp could be considered the only one who truly earned his shot at, be at becoming an Admiral, even if he turned it down. Like, the man is just pure... The man is just pure power. That's absolutely... No, no, he, he doesn't have a single devil fruit to his name. He's just pure. He's just ho all he's got is hockey, strength, and just like pure, pure, unadulterated, and unadulterated like like natural, natural talent. Like the, the, that is just how strong Garp is. So yeah, and <clears throat> but okay. After all that, and in my opinion, the Marines really lost a, a, a great, a great potential Marine, a great potential Admiral, although I understand why, again, it's not like I don't understand why, why Garp didn't, like, didn't, didn't become an Admiral, because as he said, as has been said previously, he didn't become an Admiral because that would mean serving under the Celestial Dragons, and be, being one who carries the name of D, he hates those motherfuckers. Um, but, okay, after all that, though, we cut to the end of the fight between Blackbeard and Law, where an interesting tidbit is dropped that, yeah, the pirates whose hearts Law stole to become a warlord are now part of Blackbeard's crew. So, in a sense, it is kind of an interesting twist of fate that all those pirates who were defeated by Law ended up turning to Blackbeard for refuge. Of course, leading, of course, leading to a moment where we see Blackbeard narrowly taking the op-op fruit from Law before Bebo jumps in with help from... The, an enhancement drug Chopper gave him, and yeah, there, there's obviously a whole meat and saving law, so a lot to unpack here. Obviously, the first thing to say is like, yeah, he's <laughs> like, like, like the whole meme is bound. Like, like Chopper's basically a, is, is basically a, a, a fucking drug dealer. Like, man, like man, 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 man's a doc, a, a doctoring drug dealer kind of thing. It, like, it's kind of funny. Uh, but the first thing, but okay, the first real thing though is we. We're narrowly close to learning how Blackbeard extracts a devil fruit from someone, which I'm a little annoyed by, but at least I think we know now it is a method of touch. Whether the dark, dark fruit is a part of that process still remains to be seen, though. Um, with that, though, we, we also get the reveal that the drug allows Beppo to get into a temporary Sumong form without the need for the moon, and yeah, considering how much time Chopper spent at Zoe even before Luffy got there... I'd be shocked if it didn't learn a thing or two about the, the transformation, but especially after learning everyone's injuries in the aftermath of 1 on Yeah, thankfully, thankfully to Chopper, Beppo, and Law did get away in order to fight another day. And honestly, even as a manga reader, this is one of those little things that makes me wondering where Oda is taking, is taking Law beyond this point, because Law is powerful, but it is, but Blackbeard was kind of true that, was kind of right in saying that, he still he still needs his crew and ship to properly continue the journey. So, 
like to me the, the whole law of subplot is a bit of a head scratch for me of terms of like how Oda plans to make law have have his comeback like how, how and how he puts the and how he's gonna put the pieces on the board of and 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 use them in a way like it's like he's he, he Oda has put, put these pieces on the board but what exactly is he doing with those pieces is my question I guess ultimately but uh yeah guys that's pretty much all I got for this review. If you enjoyed the video, like, comment, subscribe, follow me on Twitter, analyst Crunchyroll, be sure to notification bell, hit the subscribe button, and just share the video around, guys. Dark Knight of Enemy, signing off. Later, everyone.